it is said that they make over 47% of their profit from the year just during this time of the year. And who do you think they make much of it off of? Us. We go in and buy everything on the shelves. We go in these stores and sometimes when, when it's uh, uh, Christmas Day, by the time Christmas Day comes, it ain't nothing left on the store shelves. And we be running up and down the aisles mad because they ain't got nothing else left on the shelves. Looking for something else to buy. Looking for another peck of wood to spend our money with. Over 47% of their sales just during this time of the year, and they don't even believe in Jesus at all. Look at it for what it's worth. First shaka. Jesus was not born on the 25th of December. Jesus was not born on the 25th of December. They have celebrated Jesus' birth. They have celebrated on December 17th before. They've celebrated even, if you will look at it, January 6th before. And now they come to January 25th. Let's take a look at it. December, yes. December 25th. January 6th, I'm confused, but you're going to be confused before I finish. You think you really know what's up. You're going to really be confused when I get through tonight. You will find out before you leave out of here tonight. Hell, you may not even know how old you are. You may not even know what month you were born in. You may not even know what day it is, what year it is, what month it is, and you may not even know what time it is before I finish tonight. So I say December, I say January Wait until you see how confused these crackers are who got us celebrating this stuff. In his book, African People and European Holidays, A Mental Genocide, Reverend Ishaka Musa Barashango quotes from black historical facts on the life of Jesus. Listen carefully. December 25th was the birthday uh, December 25th, as the birth date of Jesus Christ, was not adopted until 325 CE, Christian era, A.D., at the Nicene Con Council, in an effort to harmonize and systematize the complex and diverse Christian dogma which existed at that time. A council of 318 bishops, white bishops, met in the city of Nicaea, in the kingdom of what is today Turkey, at the mandate of the Roman Emperor Constantine, and that's Bithynia. The date accepted by the majority of the European bishops assembled was not finalized until the year 354 Christian era, or 354 A.D. 354 years after Jesus was gone, these crackers at the Nicene Conference in what is Turkey today determined that they would observe his birthday, but they wanted his birthday to be in connection with certain pagan backward white holidays and pagan backward white festivals. You must know something about the winter solstice. You must know something about the Roman Saturnalia. You must know something about Nimrod. You must know something about all of this in order to understand what Christmas is all about. You must know about something about the star Sirius in order to know something about Christmas. And when you understand all of this, you will find that these crackers have got it all mixed up. Let's go to... The World Book Encyclopedia. Where are we going? This is call and response. Talk black to me. Talk back to me. Where are we going? We will turn to the World Book Encyclopedia, Volume 3. The Egyptians, who? The cracker can't tell the whole truth, so he says, were probably, 
but that's the best Chuck can do, you know what I'm saying? We're probably the first to adopt a mainly solar calendar. Calendar. They noted that the star Sirius reappeared in the eastern star, in the east, the star reappeared in the eastern sky just before sunrise after several, mo several months of invisibility. They also discovered that the annual flood of the Nile River came soon after Sirius appeared. They used this event to fix their calendar and came to recognize a year of 365 days made up of 12 months, each 30 days long, and an extra five days added at the end, but we even tightened it up more than that, but they're not giving us credit for it here. It goes on to say, and this is really interesting. It says the, the Julian calendar, and it talks about the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar and the what? Julian calendar. By the time of Julius Caesar, the accumulated error caused by the incorrect length of the Roman year, white year, and by the occasional failure to add extra days at the proper time, had made the calendar about three months ahead of the seasons. Winter occurred in September, and autumn came in the month now called July. In 46 B.C., Caesar asked the astronomer uh, Sassigenes to review the calendar and suggest ways for improving it. Acting on Sassigenes' suggestions, Caesar ordered the Romans to disregard the moon in calculating their calendar. He divided the year into 12 months of 31 and 30 days, except for February, and had only 20, it had, which had only 29 days. Every fourth year, it would have 30 days. To realign the calendar with the seasons, Caesar ruled that the year we know as 46 B.C. should have 445 days in that year. The Romans called it the year of confusion. What did they call it? Now listen to this. You with me? The Romans renamed Quintilius, that was the name of the month, Quintilius to honor. You see, at that time, the months had different names. The months were named Quintilius, Sextilius. They were named, all of these... Uh, Names, no, it, we had September, October, November, December, Sextilius, Quintilius, Junius, Aprilis, Martius. This was the name of the months at that time. So the month that was called Quintilius at that time, Julius Caesar renamed the month Quintilius to honor himself. And so the month Quintilius became July. No lie. The month July used to be called what? But the emperor Julius Caesar renamed it after who? Himself. Now we're getting into some real egos here. And we follow this stuff today. Sextilius, now that was Quintilius, now we on what? Sextilius was named August, named what? By the Roman Senate to honor the Emperor Augustus. Now here's another vein cracker, changes another month of the year and names it after himself and now Augustus, he was jealous because Caesar had changed Quintilius to July, and so he changed Sextilius to August. It hasn't got mad yet. According to tradition, Augustus, you listening to me, moved a day from February. This is some power now. This cracker took a day from February to add it to August to make sure that August was just as long as July. <laughs> Let 
Wait a minute. Before Jesus, they counted forward. Some scholars say Jesus lived 32 years. Some scholars say Jesus lived 33 years. Now, did he live 32 years or did he live 33 years? After Jesus was gone, they called that A.D., they started counting, but well, they counted backwards before. Then they started counting forward after he was gone. If I seem confused, don't worry about it. They were even more confused than I am. And we all followed him today. They counted backwards before Jesus. And then after Jesus, they started counting forward. So this is the year 1990 what? Are you sure? 1,993 years what? After Jesus. Is that right? But suppose Jesus lived... 32 years instead of 33, then that would make this 1992. But let's suppose he lived 33 years instead of 32 years, then it would be the exact year. So the question is, are you 17 or are you 18? Are you 23 or are you 24? Are you 42 or are you 44? Are you 55 or are you 56? That's the question. And which month were you born in? Were you really born in August or was it Sextilius? Were you really born in July or was it Quintilius? Or do you really know? And every year or every few years, the cracker changed the time. He said, gee whiz, from now on, I want you guys to shut your watches as of tomorrow at 12.01. At 12.01 tomorrow night, it will no longer be 1 a.m. When, when it normally was 1 a.m. It will now be 2 a.m. because we're saving time. And then next year he'll change it and say, look guys, set them back. <laughs> We don't need to save anymore. We've saved up enough time. Then two or three years will pass. He'll say, tomorrow night, as of 12.01, set your watches, guys, this time, one hour back. Instead of 1 a.m., it'll just be 12 midnight. Or instead of 10 a.m. in the morning, make sure you know that it's really 9 a.m. I know a few years ago, it was... 11 a.m. And then we went back to 10 a.m. So the question is, what time is it? What time is it? Then he named the days. Sunday. Monday. Moon day. Huh? Here we trip it on the sun and the moon days. You don't know what day it is. We don't know what time it is. We don't know what year it is. We don't know what month it is. You don't know how old you are. I'm not going to get into we don't know what our names are. Have lost our names, our language, our religion, our culture, our God, our folkways, our mores, our norms, and most of us have lost our mind. So anything I say up here tonight, you can't offer no argument, none whatsoever. We have to depend on the divine intervention of God Almighty to get us out of this thing because this devil has got this thing mixed up and fixed up. He got it hooked up. And he's trying to get an extension of time. He's trying to fool God that his time ain't up. Can you get ready for that? He's trying to fool God. Change the calendars. Change the time. Change their names. Even go into a month and take days out of the month and add it to another month. And just juggle it around the way he wants to juggle it around. Now, do we follow God or do we follow the devil? Do we follow God or do we follow the white man? Now, the book of Jeremiah, what book? 
Jeremiah, the 10th chapter. What chapter? Let me make sure it's the 10th chapter. Jeremiah, the 10th chapter, beginning with the first verse. You ready? It says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, Learn not the way of who? And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. Cuts what? A tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. And they deck it with gold, with silver and with gold. And they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. The Bible in the book of Jeremiah says that the Christmas tree is a vain and an empty practice. It's the custom of a heathen. How many heathens in the house? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> How many don't have a Christmas tree at home? Let me see. How many don't have a Christmas tree at home? How many say, but, oh, it's... It's fun. I mean, what will we tell the children? We're trying to tell the big children something now. What sense does it make, brothers and sisters, for you to work your fingers to the bone, working double time, triple time, and overtime, constantly struggling, striving, and straining to bring a smile to your baby's face and to bring joy to your baby's heart? hearts and souls, and then you go and give the credit to an imaginary white man, taking the credit from yourself, taking the honor from yourself, taking the glory and the praise and the respect from yourself, and giving the credit to a white man who doesn't even exist. And your babies grow up loving subconsciously white folks, believing that a fat white man with a red and white suit on is responsible for bringing them joy when it was really you who brought them joy. Why not tell your babies, Mommy got this for you. Daddy got this for you. This is your zawadi or your present or your gift that came from Mommy's hard work, from Daddy's hard work. Anything wrong with that? Then your baby grows up bonded with you. Your baby grows up honoring you and respecting you as the power and the force in her life or in his life that does that which brings them happiness and brings them joy. But you'd rather give the joy away and channel it through a white man who's an imaginary illusionary white man, skinny Santa Claus, fat Santa Claus, tall Santa Claus, small Santa Claus, Santa Claus with cotton all over his damn face. My little son Farrakhan would probably grab it and when Kalfani was coming up, they would probably grab that stuff and smack it. And call Brothers, you're going to have to help me. There you go. He's supposed to have some flying... Turn around the other way. Oh, he got him on both sides. This is double trouble. He's supposed to have some flying reindeer. This is supposed to be Rudolph. What kind of merry madness is this? And you tell your babies these lies about a flying reindeer. They will come down a chimney and you living over in Fort Greene. No, you ain't got no damn chimney in fourth grade. <laughs> or whatever project you in. Cracker can go all over the world and come down some chimneys that you ain't even got. And then you wonder why your babies grow up to be liars. 
Your babies grow up to be liars because you start them out on lies at an early age. You tell them about a cracker that flies around with eight reindeer flying from house to house. Crackers doing something for niggas. That's the way they talk. And it don't happen like that. Huh? You teach them about rabbits that lay chicken eggs at Easter time. And you wonder why your babies grow up to be liars when you started them out with lies. And you feed them the lie and you reinforce the lie. Every year you reinforce the lie. Even all during the year you tell them that a white man is going to come. If you be good, Santa Claus is going to bring you something good. What a fool you are. Nobody in here. It's the fools who didn't come. Nobody in here. Anybody in here? Nobody in here. Look at this cracker. Got a bag full of gifts. One bag. And it's full enough for everybody. Over five billion people on the face of the earth. Papa's got a brand new bag. <laughs> Every year he got a brand new bag and it's full. How could you do it? Come to some of your houses right now and sneak up on you and you don't know we coming. You got this cracker hanging up somewhere. You got your dead tree right there in the house. Talking about you, Ife, Abab, Bubakari, Ejani, Kool, Lumumba, Osajifo, Khalid, Kareem. And got a cracker Christmas tree in the middle of your house. What's the matter with you? What is wrong with us that we will follow these people to this degree? The most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan ask us the question, whose Christmas are you celebrating? Whose Christmas are you celebrating? Why does the tree have balls on the tree? What do the balls stand for? The balls represent the sun. Are you a sun worshiper? The wreath on the door represents the sun. Are you a sun worshiper? Do you have to get a mistletoe just to get some sugar? Is that the only way you can get some sugar is stand under some mistletoe? That's for white folks. Scared. Honey, are we having sex today? It's Wednesday. <laughs> That's foolishness. We don't have to do that kind of foolishness to keep up with these people. The star, our brothers and sisters have studied this star. Our ancestors have studied this star for a long, long time. In Kemet or in Egypt, we have studied this star. We have followed the star Sirius. And even when we go among our people, the Dogons, we will find that the Dogons have been able you could go way back up in the jungle among our brothers and sisters, our ancestors. When you study our history and our history, way back up in the woods, they had never been to any school of astronomy under the white man. And they could walk out barefoot, look up in the sky and point to a star in the sky and tell you that that star passes once every 25,000 years. Tell you at another point, that star passes once every 50,000 years. How did they know these things? It was coming up out of their genetic memory bank of the mastermind, of the God in person, of the black man and black woman. Make no mistake about it, brothers and sisters, you are from the family of God Almighty. There is no mystery God. There is no spook God. Send a shout out to the gods and earths in the house. Peace, God. I'm saying, there is no mystery, God. God is in your person, black man and woman. 
There is a part of you, every one of you, under the sound of my voice. There is a part in you that is infinite. There is a part in you that is all-wise and all-knowing and does everything right and exact. Is that right? Can I prove it? Yes. There are certain things that can happen to us. We don't even have the knowledge of how to heal it or what to do. But there's a natural healing process in the divine makeup of the black man and woman that automatically starts the healing process. Once the atom of life is planted in the womb of the black woman by the black man, there's an infinite part of us, a God part of us, a Goddess part of us that goes to work to shape and to form and to evolve and to develop that new life that has been placed in the triple darkness of the black woman's room and the black woman's the temple, the room in the womb of her temple. You must understand, brothers and sisters, that God is in the person of the black man and the black woman. Let me cover a few more points. White people believed during the winter time that the sun was dead. Can you imagine being that dumb? They thought it got cold because the sun was dead. So they would light torches. They would build fires and put torches and fires everywhere. I'm almost finished because I promised that because of the, the audience and because of uh, an earlier discussion of us following up with a part two that we would not hold you long tonight. But they would light torches build fires and put the fires and torches everywhere thinking that all of these lights all of these fires would give warmth energy power and fire to the what to the sun here the sun burns at fourteen thousand seventy two degrees fahrenheit eight hundred and fifty three thousand miles in diameter and these fools thought that they could give energy to the sun by building some fires and setting some lights and torches up on the earth. Your lights around your house, your lights on your Christmas tree. The lights represent what? The white man's effort, his backward pagan effort at trying to give life and energy to the sun because he believed that the sun was dead in the wintertime. They cut down the evergreen tree because it's evergreen. It amazed them. And it was a symbol of life. And so they cut down the evergreen tree and used it as a symbol of life and as a symbol that the sun would live again. Some of them worshipped the God among their people called Saturn. And that is why they set up the festival of the Roman Saturnalia, honoring Saturn and setting up that which would be in connection with giving warmth again and energy and fire back to the sun. That's like a fool I ran into in Washington, D.C. I saw the video. I really didn't see the Negro. You know, a, a Negro is a nigger trying to grow up. I was there, he says that he is the prepared one. And that Minister Farrakhan, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, his time is up. And that it's time for him, the prepared one, to take over. And that the palace, not our White House, but our Black House in Chicago, where the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan lives, thinks, plans, and formulates for the black nation the world over, that it's really one of the mother planes, he said. A spaceship, he said. And that he has to hurry and get in the house, and Minister Farrakhan has to move, because he knows where the controls are to the mother plane, or to one of the planes, which is the palace. He says he knows all about the universe. This is what reminds me of the white man. He knows all about the universe all the planets. He said he has study groups on all the planets, followers on all the planets. 
really bugging her. And that they come from up there and visit him here on earth, and that he travels up there to the study groups up there. One of the students at Howard University, wasn't as, even as many people that are here tonight, stood up and asked him, say, excuse me, say, you say you've been all up there in the universe? You know all about the universe? Ask you any question about the universe? He said, yes, ask me anything. He said, well, have you been to the sun? This Negro said, well, yes, I've been to the sun. So the students say, well, it was pretty hot up there, wasn't it? He said, no, I went at nighttime. <laughs> this is how smart the white man was. The white man thought in the winter time the sun's life and light and fire and energy had gone. He didn't know that the earth was rotating and that the sun never goes out. Its fire, its light, its life never ceases to this date at least. So he would build these fires and that's where your Christmas lights come from today. And again, that's where the balls on the tree and the wreath on the tree and the symbol of the evergreen tree being a symbol of life comes from. Now, brothers and sisters, just a few more points and maybe we will take one or two questions and wrap up. The Holy Quran teaches us that Mary and her baby Jesus are a sign that God Almighty has made Mary and her son Jesus a sign. What are they a sign of? I will touch this, and then I will wrap up for the evening. If the Quran teaches us that Mary and her baby are a sign, we need to look into it. First of all, brothers and sisters, virgins don't have babies. Did you hear what I said? Now, brother, you and I, we might go for that. But, sister, you know better. You know better. Virgins do not have babies. Don't tell me nothing about no Holy Ghost covered Mary. You go off a fool fighting for the white man in South Africa against our brothers and sisters, and before it's over, he's going to ask some to put on the uniform and go and fight in South Africa. He had us in Somalia killing our own people. He had us in Panama killing our own people. He had us over in Kuwait and Iraq. You might leave. Wife not pregnant. Get back. And when you get back, six, seven months later on a furlough, you come back and her stomach is out here. And you know you haven't been around in six, seven months, maybe eight months. And she meets you at the airport and she's just as happy as she can be. And you're looking at her stomach sticking way out. You ain't too happy, brother. And you ask her, and just as you get ready to ask her, she says, wait a minute, honey. Wait a minute, baby. It's not what you think. She said, while you were away, over there killing black people for the white man. While you were over there, the Holy Ghost covered me. And the child that I am carrying is a holy child. <laughs> whatever government issue you got, or whatever weapon you got, you want to go and find that ghost. Quick! Because you know that a Holy Ghost does not produce a baby. If Holy Ghost could produce babies, there is what is called the X and the Y chromosome. Is that right? And in order to have a boy baby, you must have what? X and Y chromosome. Is that right? In order to have a female baby, what's the combination? XX? Well, if, if Mary had the X chromosome, what kind of chromosome did the ghost have? No. The baby would have been XG. 
half woman, half goats. In order to have a boy baby, you must have an X and a Y chromosome. God declared this divine mathematical principle and set it in motion. And God does not change up on us in a spooky way like that. Whatever he sets in motion, he makes sure that it follows a pattern and that it stays on the course that he set it on. Holy Ghost, don't cover women and give them babies. The Holy Quran says that the one who came to Mary was in the form of a well-made man. In the form of a well-made man. Now, I don't know what that means. According to the Holy Quran, it wasn't a spook. It wasn't a spirit. It was a well-made man, according to the Holy Book. What am I saying? That the Bible is written in parables and symbols and metaphors and similes. And we must uncover the parable, the symbol, the metaphor, or the simile, or we will go in the Bible of food. So we got to know what the Bible is talking about. If the Quran says that Mary and her baby were a sign, what are they a sign of, black man and woman? They are a sign, so teaches the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, they are a sign of you and me. Mary represents the black nation. The black nation, having been here in the hells of North America now for the past 400 years, under the yoke of bondage of the white man, we have not had divine spiritual intercourse with God Almighty. And not having had divine spiritual relationship with God Almighty, we are a virgin nation of people. So teaches Elijah and Farrakhan. We are a virgin nation of people still in this condition because we had not produced a child of destiny who could get us out of this condition until the immaculate conception that took place. One on one plane with the impregnation spiritually of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad by his teacher, Master Farad Muhammad, with the divine seed of wisdom and supreme wisdom, knowledge and understanding, truth that would grow in him and ultimately, he would be able to produce a nation of people that would be the, not only the saviors of themselves, but would have a divine rendezvous with destiny and would be the saviors of black people all over the globe. But another divine relationship took place also, according to this scripture, under the signs and symbols and parables and metaphors. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad's impregnation spiritually by Master Farad Muhammad with the seed of supreme wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and truth gave birth to a baby named Louis Farrakhan. And the birth of Louis Farrakhan sets into motion the birth of a black man in our midst who comes in the image and the spirit of the Messiah and after the mold of the Osajifo or the Redeemer of black people. Listen to me carefully as I end on this note. And so a child is born, Elijah, from one relationship but ultimately produces one in our today with that power. Brothers and sisters, Jesus, who was here 2,000 years ago, the physical man is not going to come back. If he came back, you wouldn't wait to see what he had to say. No way. You'd be running over benches and knocking down walls trying to get out of the church. 
if the man who was here 2,000 years ago returned and walked in the church and said, I'm back and I'm black, you wouldn't want to have nothing to do with him. Just like you know that snakes don't talk in the garden to Eve and nobody else. No way on earth that a snake could have talked to Eve and deceived Eve. When the snake crawled in the garden, Eve would have been out of the garden, so he wouldn't even have a chance to deceive her. And if it was a talking snake, you know Eve wouldn't have snuck around to find out what the snake had to say. So it wouldn't have been no way that Eve could have been deceived by the same token. You don't expect to see Jesus coming down the turnpike, the Jersey turnpike, coming across the George Washington Bridge or through the Holland or the Lincoln Tunnel riding on a jackass or a donkey from 2,000 years ago talking about I'm back blocking up traffic in the tunnel and blocking up the traffic on the George Washington Bridge talking about I'm back and I came to save the world riding on the same damn donkey that he left on 1,993 years ago this is ridiculous huh? I said it's ridiculous it's just as ridiculous as believing that God is in the sky and the devil is under the ground. That there's a heaven in the sky and a hell under the ground. That the devil is some fellow with some red pantyhose and a pitchfork and he's going to stick you and jug you in an eternal fire and roast you forever. And that God is sitting around riding around on a cloud with a computer computing everything that you do every day. Watching you. Spying on you. And just come Putin. This doesn't make no sense. But this is what the slave master taught the slave. Just like they've sold us rabbits laying chicken eggs. Just like they've sold us a fat nasty white man in a red and white suit. They've sold us a pie in the sky in the sweet by and by after we die. Instead of something sound on the ground while we're still around. Heaven and hell are states of mind. Heaven and hell are states of being. Heaven and hell are states of existence, states and planes of existence. Heaven and hell are states of your soul and your being. States of your soul and your being. And your heaven and your hell are right here on this earth. The physics law says matter is neither created nor is it destroyed. Is that right? The physics law says all energy is constant. It's eternal. It just changes form. But you think you're going to grow some wings on your black rusty back and go flying away up in the sky somewhere. Talking about the streets are paved in gold. Don't you know as broke as this cracker is with an over four trillion dollar balance of payments deficit, if it was any damn gold up there, this cracker would have got that gold and been gone with it a long time ago. But all them ships and stuff they've been sending up there. He didn't see no gold up there. You're going to wear golden slippers and a starry crown. And every day in heaven you're going to eat milk and honey. You better have a whole lot of holy toilets up there. <laughs> milk and honey is a laxative. Tell me what you're going to shout all over God's heaven. You're going to do something else all over God's heaven. Eat milk and honey every day. And anyway, if they got milk and honey in heaven, who in the hell you think going to face them damn bees to get that honey? Who you think going to milk them cows? Huh? You better wake up. You better wake up and smell the crack. <laughs> you deserve a break today. You deserve a break today from all these lies and the falsehood that the white man has given to us. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is indeed coming back. Jesus has returned. But it is the mind of Jesus. It is the spirit of Jesus. The divine mind and the spirit of Jesus that comes in another form in another body. That's what it's talking about. Not the same man 2,000 years ago. Remember again, all energy is constant. It just changes form. Matter is neither created nor is it destroyed. And so it all comes back to us today. Garvey comes back today. 
He told you, look for me. I'll be returning, he said. Malcolm returns today. Harriet Tubman returns today. Nat Turner, back in the house. Today, Nat Turner returns today. All of them return today, brothers and sisters, but they don't return looking like they did yesterday. They return in a baby that is born from the womb of a woman. That mind returns and it is fulfilled and manifest in a new baby who is a child of destiny. We have to understand these principles that home. Take your Christmas tree down. If you go to your relative's home, your mother's home, your grandmother's home, or any of your loved ones, don't just beat them down with the truth. Don't make them so uncomfortable until they hate to see you come. You have to use wisdom. You have to use tact and skill when you go into their home. Some things you have to act like you don't even see it. And you ease the truth under them. But if you go in there cutting down a Christmas tree that's already cut down, you'll ruin a relationship with your loved ones, with your mom, with your dad, with your grandmother, grandfather. During the festival of the Roman Saturnalia, they used to kill a pig on the altar. Drain the pig, suck the blood from the pig, and then make a blood pudding. And all of them would sit down and eat blood pudding the way we eat peach cobbler or banana pudding. That was a part of the festival called the Roman Saturnalia, December the 25th. How many of you will suck blood, eat pig, and have blood pudding? Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Act like you know. Because January 1st, you're going to celebrate New Year. New Year's been celebrated in September, October, March, April, now January. Will somebody please tell me when the New Year is? And you're making New Year's resolutions, which we should do, but you're making resolutions and eating black-eyed peas and chitterlings. You know how you'll fix your big, thick African lips all to the side and try to talk proper like the white folks and eat chitterlings on a toothpick. <laughs> Trying to act like the peckerwood. What in the world can chitterlings do to give you a good year? Ham hocks and hog moles supposed to give you a good year, that this is a practice for the new year. I wouldn't. Chitlins are the bowels of the hog. The hog is a filthy animal as it is. And then for you to turn around and eat the animal's bowels, that's where he takes care of his business. Through his bowels. And you turn around and eat the pig and eat the bowels. You eat everything from his rooty to his tootie. You eat his, from his tail to his snout. You'd eat meat to grunt if you could get it out. If the white man figured out how to take the oink and put it in a box or put the oink in a package, you'd be in line eating pig oink or pickle pig oink. You eat them nasty pig feet, some of you during New Year's. Go into these stores and have them big nasty p pussy pig feet in there. The flesh of the pig is nothing but congealed pus. So for your new year, when you think it's going to bring you good luck, you are nothing but a pus eater. Just a nasty old pus eater. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> you stick the fork in them nasty pussy pig feet. See, the pig has a poor excretory system. And some of that filth runs through his hoof. And when the pig moves, he leaves a little puddle of sticky stuff. And the flies light wherever he moves. 
sucking that pussy nasty stuff that come out of his hook. And you go in there and the old cracker, the old Italians, one of them old damn Polacks, one of them old no good degos, one of them old hook nosed so called Jews, one of them nasty Arabs, the dusty, dirty, imposter Arabs. Stick a fork in there, that's what I said. Stick a fork in one of them nasty pig feet and give it to you in that wax paper and it's sticking to the wax paper. You grab one of them things and bite into it with your big, beautiful African lips and your lips get stuck. Your fingers get all stuck together. And you think that's goody juice. That's that pus sticking your lips together. That's that pus got your fingers all stuck up in there. You, you nasty pus eater. Talking about Happy New Year. Chitlin' eating food. That won't make your New Year good, brothers and sisters. No, it will ruin our health before it's over. It ruins our disposition. Whatever you eat, you become that. Get the pig out of your house. Stop eating the pig, he'll stop eating you. Because as soon as you eat him, he eats you. Make that your New Year's resolution. Don't eat that for good luck in the New Year. What is all this good luck stuff? Black cat cross your path, it's bad luck. Some of you will go all the way up to Fulton Avenue. The keep <laughs> If a black cat crossed, then the black cat should have gone to Fulton Avenue with some of us. Rabbit's foot. You think it's going to bring you good luck. Hit a damn rabbit at 40 feet. And it didn't bring him no good luck. And you get one of them and think it's going to do you some good. He had four and it didn't do him no good. Now he got three. A uh, different cracker got all four of his feet. And you think it's good luck. How could it be better luck for you than it was for the rabbit? Look at it. New Year's resolution. That's where Kwanzaa comes in. Kwanzaa, founded by Dr. Maulana Karenga in California. Founded on the seven principles of blackness or the moral minimum value system for black people. The moral minimum value system for black people. Umoji, Kuji Chagulia, Ujima, Ujima, Nia, Kuumba, and Imani. The principles of unity, uh, self determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, divine purpose, divine creativity, and Imani or faith. Seven principles starting December 26th and running through January the 1st. Seven days, and each day dedicated to the reinforcing of our morals and our values and our culture. Leading up to Kwanzaa, normally the spiritual brother or sister tries to do some kind of fast for purification. As we who are followers of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan we fast for in preparation, in purification, during what is called Ramadan. Look at it, brothers and sisters. Kwanzaa gives you the edge on your enemy. It means that you are now making a bold step. You're not just stealing away, but you're making a bold step from the thinking of your slave master. And you are deciding that you will now celebrate an alternative to his holiday. No holiday of the white man is good for us. Thanksgiving, no good. Every day should be Thanksgiving. We should give God the glory every day for bringing us this far. But don't celebrate the murder of our red brother and sister who the white man took this land from and you eating turkey with the cracker. Cranberry sauce and dressing and pumpkin pie. Not pumpkin, because that's what you're doing, pumpkin out. Eating pumpkin pie with the peck of wood. Tell me that our forefathers, the pilgrims, landed at Plymouth Rock when you got hit in the head with the damn rock. Or they landed at Ellis Island, right next to where the Statue of Liberty is. We didn't come as immigrants. We came in the holes of ships, slave ships to be made burden bearers for white America. 
The Statue of Liberty is nothing but a whore in the harbor. Nothing but a whore in the harbor, standing, holding her torch, ready to pull her dress up and shine the light and let the ships come rolling in. That's all the Statue of Liberty is. And that doesn't come from me, and it's not vulgar. It comes straight from the book of Revelations. John the Revelator calls Babylon the great whore, the mother of whores, and the abominations of the earth. John the Revelator said, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. She has become the habitation of devils. Of what? The habitation of devils, Revelation says. The whole of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird.